Hello everyone, it's Benny, and welcome to a very special bonus video of the 3D game programming tutorial series. Because in this video, we will be answering the question we left lingering in video 11. We will be talking about existing game engines, you know, the things that should in theory be handling render pipeline, motion integration, collision detection, resolution, and some form of AI. The central elements of just about every type of game you'd ever want to create. But they're not perfect with it. They typically cover some half of it, and it's not always the half you want. <laughs> so we're going to talk about what you can expect with an existing game engine, what they're typically like, what the typical flaws are, and it'll be a very general discussion. We're not going to go too deep into, oh, this is what it's like in this particular game engine. We're going to try and keep it general expectations across the playing field, because most engines typically have a similar style of strengths and weaknesses, even if the specifics tend to vary a bit. And hopefully that'll give you an idea of what you could expect if you are using an existing game engine, and where you might have to go a little bit differently if you want everything you want. So, with that being said, let's go ahead and let's answer this question. So, on the issue of render pipeline, what can you expect? Most game engines will offer you a render pipeline, and often it will be one very particular render pipeline. And that's really where the issue is. You get into it, you use the render pipeline, and on the surface it does the basics of what you want. You can put things in there, it'll draw them in 3D, you can put your own custom things in there, you can typically do some form of lighting, you can typically do maybe some basic rendering effects, and beyond that, all bets are off. Historically speaking, Unity has probably been the most infamous offender on this area of offering a fairly basic render pipeline, and making it do more than default gets, well, tricksy. There used to be a lot of talk about using custom packages for doing the UI because the UI used a bunch of draw calls by default. There used to be talk of custom packages for effects like shadows and, and post-processing effects because Unity by default didn't offer them. They've gotten better about some of that, but nevertheless, you see the issue there. It'll do something for you, but if you really want your game to look like what you want it to look like, you probably need to customize it somewhat, and that customization it isn't necessarily made easy. They have gotten better about it, so I'm not going to be too mad at Unity, but that's an example. And for counterpoint, historically, Unreal Engine has tended toward Possibly the opposite problem, if, if you want to put it that way. Because typically they offer a pretty full-featured and advanced render pipeline, assuming you want to do the standard semi-photorealistic AAA style game rendering. If you want to do that for your game, then hey, great, that's pretty much exactly what you want. If you want to do any other style at all, eh, things get very difficult very quickly because it's not really configured for that by default and you need to do a lot of customization to get it to do something different. That's historically, again. Again, Unreal has also gotten better about that. They're better about offering... Well, not so much offering. It's Both the engines have those problems by default still, but they make it a lot easier nowadays to customize it towards where you want to go than it used to be previously. It's a much easier battle these days than it what used to be, but it's nevertheless a battle. So that's what you can expect in a render pipeline for an existing game. Some simplified pipeline that's tailored towards one specific thing, whether it be a specific type of rendering style, or tailored towards a very generic case, and it's typically tricky to customize it into doing something other than that. On the issue of motion integration, your typical modern game engine will be good enough, finally. <laughs> I'll save the rant for the video on actual motion integration, but let's just say, historically, a lot of game engines, they offered a way of motion integration, and it would work really well 
in most cases. If you went to one of the edge cases, all of a sudden, things break down, things get weird, motion gets buggy in subtle ways, and it's really difficult to fix because they consider it something so fundamental to the engine that no one would need to customize it. Thankfully, a lot of games are moving on to more effective integrators so that those issues are becoming more rare. They're not totally gone altogether, and it's worth being aware of them. I'll talk about that again in that video. But on this point, at least, for your typical modern game engine, motion integration should be good enough. So that part is good. It's not perfect, though. I want to point that out. There is a better way to do motion integration than just about every game is doing right now. And I will also talk about that in the motion integration video. But you can expect the motion integration to be good enough for just about any realistic game you'd want to do, in most games. On Collision, it's typically good under certain assumptions. The traditional mindset for Collision in games is, well, Collision relates to physics. Most games want things to behave more or less physically, so we'll do this with a physics simulator. We'll just simulate physics, we'll throw games under that simulation, and everything should work nicely. Which is a good theory, and it works in a lot of cases. In my space shooter, I typically want my bullets to be moving according to the laws of physics. They should be flying through the air, obeying some physical laws, right? Right. The problem is, there's often a lot of times in games when you want things to be not so physical, or you want to do something that's kind of related to collision detection and resolution that isn't really a physics thing. For instance, our platformer dude, when he's jumping around, suddenly jumping again in midair, or suddenly doing a dash in the midair, or boosting around, or jumping off walls, probably breaking a few laws of physics here and there in the process. So, Typically, you would code that as special exceptions into the collision system, and there's often not really a, the best, nicest way to do that. It's not usually the hugest of deals, since it's just one character, but the more in-physical things you have in your world, the more tricky and complicated that can get. And sometimes you have cases like the gun shooting its hit scan at the player. That's something related to collision detection and resolution. You're detecting if the ray collides with anything, and you're resolving it by damaging this. So it should follow the system that handles collision detection and resolution. It would make sense if it follows that paradigm. But ironically, that's typically very difficult to integrate into the collision system of any existing game engine. Because, well, most game engines are really married to this idea of collision and physics being together. So typically you'd have to do this sort of thing separately in its own thing, which isn't very elegant. And again, the more things you have like this that use something involving collision detection and resolution that aren't directly related to that physics simulation, the trickier and messier that can get. And at some point you pretty much have your own system of collision detection and resolution, and it does everything, and then the physics system does the rest. So it it's a bit weird. <laughs> it's a bit weird how that works. So. That's why I say it can be inflexible, and it can also be overkill if you don't really need a lot of advanced physics simulation. The game engines nowadays all boast about their new advanced physics simulators. We can simulate realistic cloth flapping in the wind. It used to be, we can simulate realistic ragdolls. And here's the thing, if, if those aren't important to your game, so what? Why do you care? That's just a waste of code and potentially computation power if it's enabled for some reason. So. It can definitely be overkill. There's also there's usually a lot of things in there that just aren't necessarily important to your game. So, bottom line, it's typically good. It offers a good basis. It's really the biggest issue is probably that it's inflexible. It's hard to make it do more. It can often do a lot of things that you probably don't really care about and aren't that important. But, I don't know. <laughs> they do it anyways because reasons. As far as AI goes, it's a complete toss-up. <laughs> game engines typically offer some AI-like things, like pathfinding is fairly common nowadays, some way to, for, to find paths around the 3D world. 
beyond that, it's a total toss-up. It's probably not going to have the AI features you want for your specific use case. You're probably going to end up having to code this yourself, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. AI is diverse enough and hard to generalize enough right now that, you know, there's probably not a general AI package that works for a huge variety of different games. But just know, whatever AI you do, you're probably going to end up needing to write a lot of it yourself for just that reason. It's very hard to make an AI system that works for a very large variety of different games. So there you go. Those are all our critical game features, and that's how existing game engines typically handle them, more or less, as of this video. Again, technologies evolve, and thankfully, the general trend has been getting better. Game engines have been getting better and better about all of these issues, and that's a good thing. That's what I want to see. That ideal, In an ideal world, game engines would handle all of these in a nice, elegant way that's easy to customize for whatever type of game you want, and the only half of it done is, or hard to integrate your own additions to it, isn't even an issue. But alas, this is where things are right now. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, that is all I have to say about the state of existing game engines on these sorts of topics. So I hope you enjoyed. I hope that was somewhat informative of just the general state of how things are. And if you're interested in learning how to actually do these yourself, even if the game engine doesn't provide it for you, then stay tuned for the next videos in the game programming tutorial series, where we will be building our own render pipeline, our own motion integrator, our own collision detection and resolution, so you will know how you can handle these things in a nice and efficient manner, even if the game engine isn't quite capable of covering your needs. That is what's coming up in the next video. Stay tuned. Thank you very much for joining me. As always, if you want to talk more with me or other like-minded people, then please join the Benny Discord. It's an awesome place and everyone is welcome. If you like these videos and want to support them, or you just want to find out what happens next right now, then consider becoming a patron on Patreon. And a very special thank you to my patrons, and especially those listed in the video description, for making videos like this possible. Thank you very much, and I will see you all in the next video.